The Lord be with you and also be with you. I know I'm a bit of a shock to see, but last week when we thought of the prophets, I dressed up a bit as a prophet and today I've dressed up as someone else and I told about that last week. Uh, here's our Advent ring. I took the one that Diane made down to church and it's too heavy to bring there and back. So this is one that uh, I made earlier. And you'll remember Advent, the first Sunday of Advent, uh, we remembered uh, the great Old Testament heroes who were looking for God's promise to be fulfilled. Then we moved on to the prophets and we heard about the way in which they were looking for a coming king. And we thought of Samuel. And today, ta-da, uh, we think of John the Baptist. And he was a wild character. So he wore camel hair, which is why I put this on, uh, a leather belt, uh, which I've, I've also got on. And uh, I've got up here uh, honey. He loved honey. I wonder if you do. And he also liked eating wild locusts. So it's a bit like I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Uh, I think that must have been disgusting. But anyway, he loved them. And so today, as we think of John the Baptist, I want to encourage us to think of our own baptism. At the baptism that was ours, if we were a child, these words were said on our behalf. As an adult or at baptism services, we may have responded to God by saying, I turn from my sins, I repent of my sins, and I turn to Christ. And I encourage us as we listen to John the Baptist saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Let's prepare the way of the Lord by remembering our baptism. So here I've got some water. There it is. And at the baptism, there it was. I just going to shake my head. We were baptised in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit as a picture of saying, I'm not going to live for myself. I want to make a complete new start and live in every part of my life for God. At work, as we've heard from Rachel, from Mike, from Gislaine, in church, wherever we are in our family life, to live for God. So let's light a candle remembering John the Baptist. Here we go. And at baptism services at St. Peter's, you get given a lighted candle. And it's a picture of saying, we're welcoming Jesus. We're welcoming Jesus into our hearts, our lives, all our thought life, all our decisions. Come, Lord Jesus, light of the world, come and lighten our darkness. So let's begin. Uh, with a prayer of sorry, so that we uh, repent of uh, all that we've done. Let us pray. Dear loving Lord, forgive us for the ways that we please ourselves rather than seeking to please you, living for ourselves rather than living for you. So today, as we draw close to you, draw close to us, and may the light of your love shine on us today and shine on our path throughout the week and may we be a light of hope and love and joy to others amen
The reading today is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 1. The Proclamation of John the Baptist In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Ichurea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias the ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Before I speak, let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, the Bible. Help us to hear you speaking to us today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you remember those days when we had people over to stay? When we had people for dinner? When we had Parties. Those days will return. Well, I remember my last significant birthday. I decided to have a big party. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I live by lists. I make lists for everything, lists of what I'm going to do in, in a week and then lists of what I'm going to do each day of that week. I live by my lists. So preparing for my party, I was in my element. Right. A list of everyone I was going to invite. And then a list of those who said yes. I had to sort out what food I was going to have. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, the balloon man I had to contact. I had to sort out my cake. Yep. Yeah. Ooh, yes. And then there was the DJ. He was on my list because yeah, the music is so important. Yep. Yeah. What music was I going to have at my party? And really importantly was what music I was going to have for my secret solo dance with my dad. Ah, the other thing that was on my list, of course, of course, the bubbly, so that everybody could toast me. Yes. Ooh, and the other thing that was on my list, and that took me forever to get the right one, was my dress. Oh, yes. I prepared for this party like nobody's business. Why? Well, I wanted a good time, you know, it was my birthday. But also, I wanted my guests to turn up in my hall and I wanted them to go, wow, this looks great. And I wanted them to enjoy themselves. And I wanted to look fantastic. Yeah. Whatever we are doing, you know, if we're having guests for dinner, if we're having guests overnight to stay, if we're having a big party, to prepare. Preparation is the key. We have to prepare. Now, I wonder if you heard that word prepare in our Bible reading this morning. It's from St Luke's Gospel. And St. Luke tells us of John the Baptist, that great prophet of the New Testament. And he says this, 
the word of God came to John in the wilderness. In other words, God spoke to John with a message for his people. And so Luke tells us that John is the fulfillment of a prophecy made by, made by Isaiah centuries before. Yes, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said that there would be a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And this, says St Luke, is who John is. He is that voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, in ancient times, roads were not as they are now. They were little more than dirt tracks. So when a town heard that an emperor or a king or some other important person was coming that way, the townspeople had to go out and clear the road of, of rocks, of stones. They had to try and make it a bit more straight so that that king or that emperor's chariot didn't topple over as it did this in winding roads. Now, John isn't warning the people of Israel that the emperor is about to arrive or that any of those other important people that St Luke mentioned at the beginning of, his, of the reading we had were going to arrive. No. John is telling the people that someone much more important is on their way. And that person is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. And the preparation that the people of Israel need to do isn't any transformation of the roads. It's transformation of their own lives. Yes, says St Luke, John preaches a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Well, let's just think what that means. Jewish people didn't get baptised. Baptism was for people who wanted to convert from another religion to Judaism, to follow the Jewish God. But John is calling the Jewish people to repent and to be baptised as a sign, as a symbol of their repentance. And then he promises the forgiveness of sins. This is what they need to do, he says, to prepare for Jesus' arrival. And what does he mean by repent? Well, to repent is to recognise that your life is not as God wants it to be. That you are doing things, saying things that are wrong. And then to say sorry for those wrong things and to completely turn your life around so that you start doing the things that God wants you to do, that you start behaving in the way that God wants you to behave. In other words, you become a transformed person. And later on in St Luke's Gospel, we read that people who came to John the Baptist said to him, well, well, what should we do? And he says to the rich people, share what you have. He says to the tax collectors and the soldiers, be honest in your work. Now, in this season of Advent, we remember that Jesus is coming back. John's message for the people of Israel that day stands for us today because we are waiting for Jesus' second coming. And we too 
like those people John was talking to who were waiting for Jesus' first coming, we too need to prepare. And that means that we too need to look at the lives we are living. We have to look at the people we are. We have to look at how we are behaving at home, at school, at college, in our everyday lives, wherever we live our lives. And we need to ask ourselves, is this how God wants me to live? What in my life needs to change? so that I am more the sort of person God wants me to be. If Jesus returned now, would I be ashamed? But unlike preparing for a party, this preparation is a lifelong task. We have to keep on looking at ourselves. Because none of us is perfect. We will have to keep on saying sorry to God and trying to turn our lives around. And that's fine. Because as John preached and as the Bible constantly tells us, God forgives all who truly repent. Well, you're probably wondering, what was my significant birthday? Well, a lady over the age of 21 and under the age of 70 never gives away her age. And you're probably wondering, what was that piece of music you chose for your solo dance with your dad? Well, it was Nancy Sinatra's These Boots Are Made For Walking. And those of you who watch Strictly, (laughs) Strictly has nothing on the dance I did with my dad that night. And my dress? It was a black silk number. And to quote Craig Revel Hallward from Strictly, I looked gorgeous, darling, absolutely gorgeous. Let us pray. As in our imagination we join the crowds flocking to the desert river to be baptised by John, let us pray that we too may long for the healing and cleansing of God's forgiveness. When I say we are open to your will, you may like to respond, O Lord, hear our prayer. We are open to your will. O Lord, hear our prayer. We pray that the worldwide church, full with the richness of diversity, may argue less and focus more on Jesus our Saviour, who we find outstretched in welcome and acceptance. We are open to your will. O Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have too much and those who have too little. May we learn to share resources more generously, live more simply and be more thankful and content. We are open to your will. O Lord, hear our prayer. Today we pray for the work of City Hearts a charity in Liverpool working to restore the lives of people who have been rescued from modern slavery. We pray for the healing work of their safe houses, for the distribution of wellbeing packs and all their programmes to help individuals make a new life. We pray for all who need healing, resilience and perseverance and those whose pain loneliness or hunger causes suffering in body or mind. We pray for those who are on our hearts and minds today in a minute of silence.
We are open to your will. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the lives of those who have died and pray for all who are grieving. We pray that we learn to live in your presence, growing more and more like Jesus until we see you face to face. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We bring our time of prayer to an end by joining together to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in our worship this morning. I've just got a few notices to give out before our blessing, um, but can I just remind you to look at our website for full details of the services that will be taking place throughout the rest of December. Well, next Sunday we have our Nativity service. And our nativity service will be held on Zoom at four o'clock. And if you wish to join us, you need to contact Lorraine Fletcher and she will send you the invite for that service. Now you might be thinking, I don't have any kids. I don't need to go to a nativity service. Or you might be thinking, I've seen so many nativity plays. Do I want to go to another nativity service? You do. You do. This is a nativity service with a difference. I've had a sneak preview at the play, which forms a major part of that service. And let me tell you, it is, to quote Craig Revel Horwood again, fabulous. It really is brilliant. Do join us for a good service. And after that service, we will have a time of fellowship together with tea, coffee, whatever, and just a bit of a chat. So that's next Sunday, the 20th of December at four o'clock. 
Some of our amazing children here at St. Peter's have provided their acting skills, gifts and talents to recreate a modern Zoom nativity for you. And here's a little taster and trailer of what's to come. And I really hope and pray that you join us next Sunday. Thank you. Now, we may not yet have said goodbye to 2020, but I think probably most of us are looking forward to 2021. And why not begin 2021 by getting to know your Bible better? Yes, we are going to be running something called the Bible Course. And that will be starting on Thursday, the 21st of January at eight o'clock via Zoom. So if you would like to join us for that or you just want more information, have a look at our website in the read section of the website and you'll find full details about that course and a link to the Bible Society's website where you can find out some more information. And I'd encourage you, please, to just, just consider joining us for that. Um, whether you are new to reading the Bible, whether you're a mature Christian, whether you've just finished the Alpha course, it's for, for everybody. Um, so please, can I encourage you just to have a look at our website and more details about that. Um, there is a book uh, which accompanies the course, um, and on our website you'll see details of if you would like that book, how you need to, to let me know and the cost of, of that book. And finally, um, issue three of our prayer journal is now out on our website and you'll find that in the pray section of our website. And you'll notice that the picture in the journal has now changed to a winter scene. And that's a picture courtesy of our very own Ian McCall. Speaking of whom, Ian will be taking us through our Bible reading um, after the blessing in, in a sermon that's aimed more at adults. So please do stay for uh, Ian's sermon after the blessing. Let's just take a moment of quiet. And then I'm going to ask God to bless each one of us today. May we go knowing that the Lord goes with us. May we let him lead us each day into the quiet places of our hearts and allow him to speak with us. May we know that he loves us that he forgives us with a gentle understanding. And may we know that he is with us always, wherever we are 
and however we may feel. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us this day and always. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our reading today introduces us to John the Baptist's ministry, which took place, as we are told, in the region around the Jordan. The river flows from the Sea of Galilee in the north to the Dead Sea at its southern end. There is a long tradition that the place where Jesus was baptised was quite close to the Dead Sea. That John baptised at that end of the river would make sense as that is the nearest point to Jerusalem and many of those who heard him preach came out from there, a distance of about 20 miles. It was also only some five miles from the town of Jericho and possibly very near the point at which Joshua had led the Israelites over the river into their new homeland many centuries earlier. Curiously though, Luke doesn't actually tell us where John was baptising. He leaves us perhaps to assume it was in the river. It is Matthew and Mark who are explicit about that. For Luke, however, the wilderness setting of his ministry seems to have had greater significance. The river valley itself, a long narrow trough with deep escarpments on both sides, was relatively fertile with a long history of agriculture. But the surrounding area was wilderness, rough, rocky, uncultivated land though not necessarily completely barren. It was where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and where the monastic style community of Qumran was based at that time. It was there, in the wilderness, that the word of God came to John. The challenge to repentance and the promise of forgiveness which he proclaimed. We are not told how he came to be there in the first place, but there were certainly Jews at that time who went out into the wilderness to seek an encounter with God, just as today we might go on a retreat or a pilgrimage. There is also a view among scholars that John may have had links with Qumran, perhaps as a former member of that monastic community. Wilderness had played an important part in the story of Israel. The refugees from Egyptian slavery encountered God in the wilderness at Sinai. It was the beginning of their existence as a nation, a place of trials and testing, a place of preparation before they could enter the land that was to become their home. For Jesus too, there was a time in the wilderness, a time of trials and testing, a time of preparation at the start of his ministry. Not the 40 years of the refugees from Egypt, but 40 days as he faced temptation and worked out how his own calling was to be fulfilled. There was another wilderness journey too, the quotation from Isaiah with which Luke introduces us to John referred originally to that, the root of the exiles returning home from their captivity in Babylon more than 500 years before the time of Jesus. In Isaiah 40, a voice, just a voice, cries out with the words, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. But now that voice is John's, as he becomes the voice of one crying in the wilderness, 
prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Prepare, prepare the way for the Lord to come. A preparation that wasn't a matter of decorating their homes, nor was it primarily about undertaking a religious ritual. It was to be much more personal, much deeper, a change of heart, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance. What did this mean? At the very least, a change of direction, a different outlook on life, on its meaning and its purpose. That's the basic meaning of the Greek word metanoia, translated in the New Testament as repentance. But our text has a sharper focus. John was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, from which we must conclude that whatever else it might have involved, it certainly meant turning away from sin, leaving it behind, not simply saying sorry and carrying on regardless. I remember being at a home group once where we had been looking at the passage in Romans 7 where Paul writes of circumstances where we don't do the good we want to, but instead the evil we don't want to. That's a statement that needs to be read in context. Taken out of context, it is quite defeatist. And I was saddened when a member of our group took it, as it seemed to me, that way, with what I felt was an air of total resignation. Better by far to go back to the previous chapter in Paul's letter, where he says, Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That sentence misused might lead to spiritual pride, but wisely used, it sets us a goal. With the goal, we might not succeed all the time, but without it, we can be sure of failing all the time. What do we mean by sin? We use the word a lot in the Christian community and there is a danger that we trivialize it and fail to get to grips with it. It isn't simply about bad behavior but more about the attitude of heart from which that comes. Yes, indeed, we talk and the Bible speaks of sins in the plural, sins of action, sins of speech, sins of thought and sins of neglect. But the root cause is sin in the singular, the attitude of heart, the hardness of heart, the inclination from which all these sins come. It's the attitude that needs to change and the behavior will follow. The behavior is like a sneeze, just a symptom. It is the illness that needs to be dealt with. I'm not sure that I can give a simple and precise definition of sin. I do find it helpful to think of it in terms of failing to be the person I would like to be but my portrait of the person I would like to be is influenced by many factors. These include my Christian convictions and experience, but even so, my portrait may be tainted by sin, self-regard, self-centeredness, a reluctance to place my life wholly in God's hands. But repentance is not about apologising to God for the sneeze. Rather, it is about attending to the underlying disease. The challenge for us in the message of John the Baptist is to examine ourselves as to whether our thoughts, our outlook, our attitudes, our deepest desires are right in God's eyes. 
in the words at the end of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. John received the word of God in the wilderness and it was in the wilderness that he proclaimed it. It was rough, uncultivated ground. We might say disordered, but it was also a place away from the pressures and the sophistication of the city. A place to get off the treadmill of life, a place to find time for reflection. For some of us, it may be a metaphor of the place we feel we're in with our lives now especially with the effects of the pandemic. Rough, disordered ground. No clear landmarks to give us a sense of direction, but still a space for reflection, an opportunity to draw closer to God and find new direction from him. It might not be possible to go on a retreat or a pilgrimage in present circumstances, and we might feel we haven't gone by choice into this particular wilderness, wilderness situation and certainly not with an intention simply to look for God here. But it is still possible to draw aside and seek God in prayer, perhaps using some of the resources that Julia is putting on the church website. And it is often in these wilderness situations that God breaks through into our lives. When we lived in Marlborough, we were friends with a couple, one of whom, Sue, belonged to our home group. Her husband, Mike, used to come down to meet her and walk home with her at the end of the evening, but he had no interest in joining her either in the group or in church. Until, until, the night when he had a deep sense of being held in God's hands as he was taken at speed under flashing blue lights for the 50 miles to Bristol for heart surgery. The wilderness may be a metaphor for the place we feel we're in. It can also be a metaphor for our very lives. Isaiah's words might then apply directly to us when we heed John's call and resolve to order those lives in God's way. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth. Words which convey honesty, sincerity, gentleness and love. It's a, it's a transformation which comes as we allow ourselves to receive his forgiveness of the sins which are on our conscience and the burden of guilt and shame is lifted. This is the salvation of God, offered as John proclaimed it to all humanity. And so a prayer to finish. Holy God, we hear your call to align our lives with the way of Jesus. We acknowledge that we can't change by ourselves and need the help of your Holy Spirit dwelling within us. But we make this our desire now. And for your love revealed in forgiveness, for your love revealed in your saving power, for your love revealed in the birth of Jesus, for your love revealed in his death and resurrection, we give you thanks and praise. Amen.